Skyline Building. My name is Edward Halperin, and I'm going to talk with you this afternoon about issues related to eugenics, the Holocaust, as a prequel and sequel to the exhibit that you either have seen or will see, and then attempt to tie these issues to modern concepts of ethical issues facing us, and we might learn from the past in relationship to our problems of the present and future in medical ethics. I'm the chancellor of the college, and I'm a radiation oncologist to take care of children with cancer who need radiation therapy, and I also work in the history of racial, religious, and gender discrimination in medicine and medical ethics. The story that we are going to talk about this afternoon begins with Charles Darwin. Darwin publishes on the origin of species in England at the time of the American Civil War. Darwin, at this point in his life, having come back from the voyage on the Beagle, is relatively reclusive. He does not do many public discussions of his book. He leaves that to surrogates, such as Huxley, who was referred to as Darwin's attack dog. Darwin, therefore, does not coin the species survival of the fittest. Herbert Spencer does, but it quickly becomes shorthand for the idea that individual organisms can, through a process of mutation, develop characteristics which promote them to survive whereas others do not. Intellectuals in the United Kingdom and the United States are thinking about Darwin at the same time of a resurgence of knowledge about Gregor Mendel, the monk who does experiments on sweet peas and identifies how the inheritance of wrinkled versus non-wrinkled peas and changes in the leaves of the peas are transmitted and comes up with the idea that these are genetically transmitted to what we call autosomal dominant and autosomal recessive genes. The confluence of these ideas, those of Mendel and those of Darwin, come together in the idea of eugenics. The word eugenics is from the 19th century principle of social Darwinism. Many of you will think of William Jennings Bryan, the man who ran for president for three times as sort of a buffoonish character, because what you know of him is from the play Inherit the Wind, where the character portrays him as Matthew Harrison Brady, who is trying to keep Scopes in jail for teaching evolution. William Jennings Bryan was actually extremely concerned about social Darwinism. He thought it would ultimately lead to the death of large numbers of people. And that is what he was concerned about, and that was what was driving him. Because social Darwinism was the belief that not only do individuals, but social groups, such as races and cultures, are in constant competition for achievement and survival. And certain cultural characteristics were thought to be adaptive, and others maladaptive, the same as for individual organisms. And if you think about it in the context of its time, this fits perfectly with British imperialism and American manifest destiny. If there are social characteristics which are beneficial, they must be those which make some of us white Anglo-Saxon Protestants to rule over the Indians and to rule over the Africans and to rule over the Native Americans on the North American continent. Therefore, social Darwinism not only is alleged to make scientific sense, but it fuels its political imperative to say that imperialism is justified by science. And then we come to Darwin's cousin, Francis Galton. Now, many of you know Francis Galton because you probably suffered through high school algebra and had to learn about linear regression analysis. And Francis Galton is the one who figures out linear regression analysis. Francis Galton is a polymath. At one point in his life, he tries to figure out whether or not randomized prospective trials demonstrate the efficacy of prayer. <laughs> and he reasons that which ships should sink more often if prayer works? The ships that bear missionaries on their way to Africa or the ships that do not bear missionaries on their way to Africa? The missionaries must be praying for safe arrival, so their ships should sink less often. He also reasons that who should live longer in England? people who are prayed more often for. God save our blessed queen. It must be the royal house and the Archbishop of Canterbury and his family. 
In both cases, he finds the prayer does not work with a p-value of 0.05. Uh, the prayer he therefore concludes is inefficacious. <laughs> Francis Galton becomes interested in the work of his cousin Charlie and in the work of Mendel. And this is one of Francis Galton's notebooks. And you can see him writing in Greek, trying to come up with a word to describe what he's working on. And he comes up with it, eugenics. He invents the word. This is Francis Galton taken in a classic eugenics picture, frontal and lateral views with labels of anthropomorphic characteristics, the width of the head, the width of the brow, when he goes to visit a researcher in this area. In the United States, the great proponent of eugenics is Charles Davenport of the Cold Spring Harbor National Laboratory, the same Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory today. He defines it as improvement of the human breed. And Charles Davenport, who directs the eugenics record office at Cold Spring Harbor, was elected to the National Academy of Science in 1912. Eugenicists thought it was a good idea to enhance the quality of the human species by regulating reproduction. And what you see in this discussion is so-called gentle eugenics up to more severe eugenics. Gentle eugenics is promote certain people to marry and discourage other people from marrying. The next step is, well, not only discourage some people from marrying, but sterilize them either with their consent or against their will so they won't reproduce ultimately saying some people not only shouldn't reproduce, they shouldn't be around, and they should be killed. Among progressive Americans, eugenics takes hold across the political spectrum. President Theodore Roosevelt thinks it's a great idea. So does his successor, William Howard Taft, who becomes Chief Justice in the US Supreme Court after he is no longer president. President Wilson, Woodrow Wilson, thinks it's a good idea. Margaret Sanger of Westchester County, New York, the founder of Planned Parenthood thinks it's a good idea. Why? Wouldn't it make more social sense to keep people from having babies than to build more prisons? Wouldn't it make more social sense to keep some people from having babies than building orphanages or building homes for unwed mothers? Let's regulate reproduction and we'll all be better off because we'll spend less in tax dollars and we'll have less unhappy people dissatisfied with their lives if we only try to regulate reproduction. We understand now how animals are more likely to survive or not because of evolution. Human intellect should be used to regulate human reproduction. This was the height of progressivism. This was eugenics. And my point is that this is not a German idea. This is a British American idea. We thought of it. Ultimately, as the logo for the exhibit we have on display here at the college shows, the tools of the eugenicist, calipers to measure the width of the bridge of the nose or the width of the head, pedigrees, leads ultimately in its logical, its sinister conclusion, to the Holocaust. Late, by the late 19th century, eugenics movements were founded in the UK, in the US, in Canada, Russia, throughout Europe and Asia. There were eugenics research institutes at the great universities of Western Europe. This is a poster for eugenics. Eugenics is like a tree, and it draws its materials from many sources and gives them organic unity and purpose. Eugenics is the self-direction of human evolution. Okay? If we are smart enough to build roofs over our head, to irrigate our crops, if we are smart enough to build steam engines for ships and railroad trains, if we are smart enough to control our own destiny by controlling human reproduction to make the world a better place. That's why it was considered the height of progressive thought. This is a poster for a eugenics convention in Dresden in 1911, and you see the origins of the logo for our exhibit. And these are the tools of the eugenicist, measuring the width of a baby's head with a eugenics caliper and then recording it to identify certain racial characteristics. When Weissman puts the final nail in the coffin of Lamarckism, then eugenics gets another boost. Remember Lamarckism from high school biology, that animals acquire behavioral characteristics during their lifetime, and somehow that can be passed on. No, it can't. It arises through mutations. And the idea, therefore, that you might modify behavior by adaptation is thought to be old hat. It has to be in our genes. There's nothing people can do about it. They are born with a tendency to be criminals. They are born with a tendency to have children out of wedlock. And we have to stop these people from having babies so society will be better off. The first International Eugenics Congress takes place in 1912. 
Does it take place in Munich or Heidelberg or Berlin? No, it takes place in London, the home of the idea. In 1922, at the Great Medical School in Uppsala, north of Stockholm, a State Institute for Racial Biology is established and endowed chair the next year at the University of Munich. These are the tools of the eugenicists for the physicians or medical students in the audience. You recognize them, right? Little rectangles for males, little circles for females. You mark them, coloring them in or drawing lines for them for death or for being a representative case. But to the eugenicists, they're not writing down whether there's a family history of Crohn's disease or cardiovascular disease or potentially heritable cancer. They're writing down mentally deficient, epileptic, had child out of wedlock, arrested for a crime, to see whether these behavioral characteristics move from generation to generation. Then public health posters appear. Why should the heroic German worker, the blonde, blue-eyed worker, bear on his shoulders at the cost of 50,000 Reichsmarks a year dealing with the criminal or the uh, in this case, a drawing of a Down syndrome individual. Why should the worker do that? Wouldn't it be better if the worker did not have to bear the burden of this on his back with the tax dollar? Oh, yes, but Edward, that's Germany. No, it's not. This is an American public health poster. America needs less of these and more of these. The light flashes every time a good one is born or a bad one is born. Learn about heredity. You can help correct these conditions. Another American public health poster. How long are we Americans to be so careful for the pedigree of our pigs and chickens and cattle and then leave the ancestry of our children to chance or to blind sentiment? Get with it, Americans. Understand eugenics. Understand heritability. Make the world a better place. <coughs> Best-selling books of the era. This is 1929, not from Germany, from the New York publisher Macmillan. Sterilization for Human Betterment, a summary of the results of 6,000 operations in California over a 20-year period, 1909 to 1929, sterilization of Americans by court order against their will. Uh, the case for sterilization by Leon Whitney, director of the American Eugenics Society. This is a British public health poster of the era. If this man had only been sterilized, there would not have been born an asocial female, four deaf and dumb, three stammers, two epileptics, one mentally deficient female, one deformed abnormal female, together 12 hereditarily diseased. If this man had been sterilized, get with it, do the sensible thing. Let's start sterilizing people, citizens of England. Well, where do we start seeing this being manifest? Anti-immigration laws. After World War I, the United States passes laws saying, close the borders. We will only allow people to be in this country as a reflection of their current status in the population. Therefore, we have a big quota from people from England and a tiny, qu tiny quota from those from Russia. We don't want Roman Catholics from Italy or from Ireland. We want Roman Catholics from England. And the United States shuts the door to immigration after World War I, and it continues that way through World War II. That is a manifestation of this. And then the next step, and that is compulsory sterilization under court order in Scandinavia, Canada, Switzerland, and two dozen states in the United States. The way this was typically done is you would have a tribunal of three doctors. A social worker or a doctor says, Ms. Jones over there keeps having babies out of wedlock or her kids are criminals, so I recommend she be sterilized. If the tribunal of doctors recommends it, then the court orders her to be sterilized. And this was typically done by tying the fallopian tubes or by uh, removing the ovaries although even within my specialty, uh, irradiating the ovaries was done sometimes for sterilization if they didn't want to do it surgically. By 1923, when I have a first set of data to show you, 15 of the 27 states in the United States have sterilized people labeled, quote, feeble-minded, epileptic, criminal, five with nervous disorders. Ultimately, about 16,000 Americans would be sterilized by court order. You may have noticed in the paper that the North Carolina State Legislature recently defeated a bill to pay reparations to survivors of sterilization, saying we don't really know who they are, we're not sure how to account for the cost of it, etc. But this goes on until the 1960s in the United States. There are people uh, alive who were sterilized by court order. Here's the Race Betterment Conference in the United States in 1914, quite elegant uh, dinner of the scientific meeting. 
And here is Carrie Buck and her mother. Carrie Buck gets labeled in Virginia as a loose woman because she is claimed to be mentally retarded. They assert that her mother is mentally retarded, and they say she gave birth to a mentally retarded child. Three generations of the mentally retarded. Historians have now clearly demonstrated that Carrie Buck was not mentally retarded, that her daughter got straight A's in school, that she was molested by a family member and thus impregnated. The family wanted to get her out of town, and they put her in the Virginia State Asylum for the feeble-minded. Lawyers who want to prove that <coughs> sterilization in the United States is constitutional hire a lousy lawyer for Carrie Buck and get him to sue the superintendent of the asylum. The lawyer does a terrible job of defending Carrie Buck intentionally so that the case eventually works its way to the Supreme Court to see if they can get a court ruling about whether or not it is legal to sterilize people. The legal principle is based on the concept of vaccination. If we do not allow children to go to public schools without being vaccinated, if we do not allow people to maintain their property in a dirty manner so that the fumes of your waste dump are not allowed to waft into your neighbor's house, if we do not allow people to run around with infectious disease, if the government can do those three things, vaccinate people by mandate, tell you how you can maintain your property, tell you where you can't, can't go, doesn't the government have the power to tell you whether you can be sterile or fertile or not? That is the constitutional principle. The defendant in the case is Dr. James Bell, the superintendent of the asylum, and the case is argued before the United States Supreme Court in April 19. 27, Buck versus Bell, the court makes its decision within three weeks. The United States Supreme Court has a majority decision written by Mr. Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr., the great dissenter, a veteran of the Civil War, a justice of the Massachusetts Supreme Court, and then the United States Supreme Court, the magnificent Yankee, as the movie of his life from Hollywood described him. What does the United States Supreme Court decide? By a vote of eight to one, it upholds sterilization, finding that the Virginia sterilization law is valid to protect society, is quite analogous to compulsory vaccination. It is within the power of the government. And Mr. Justice Holmes writes his famous concluding paragraph of the decision, it is better for all the world if instead of waiting to execute degenerate offspring for a crime or let them starve for their imbecility, society can prevent those who are manifestly unfit from continuing their kind. The principle that sustains compulsory vaccination is broad enough to cover cutting the fallopian tubes. Three generations of imbeciles are enough. Eight to one. Who possibly voted no? Well, this is New York Medical College, the Turo system. It had to be Mr. Justice Brandeis, right? The first Jewish member of the United States Supreme Court, appointed by Woodrow Wilson. That would make sense. It wasn't. Mr. Justice Brandeis voted with the majority. The only justice who voted no Mr. Justice Butler. Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, William Howard Taft, did not approve of writing dissenting opinions. He thought it was uncollegial. He thought it was grandstanding. So we do not know what Mr. Justice Butler was thinking when he voted no. Uh, this is him in a later picture. He was appointed to the Supreme Court by Warren G. Harding. He was a corporate lawyer. At that time, he was the only Roman Catholic member of the Supreme Court. Uh, that is all we know about what his reasoning might or might not have been. Uh, so now it's constitutional. Here is a map from the Literary Digest, uh, and this was the Reader's Digest of its time, although I guess if I use that metaphor anymore, very few people will know what I'm talking about. But, uh, uh, this shows the states in the Union that uh, had compulsory sterilization. Stippled meant compulsory sterilization. Black meant not only compulsory sterilization to prevent loose women from reproducing, but also that judges can impose sterilization as a punishment for crime. A burglary, etc. you could be sterilized. Uh, the laws for Indiana about compulsory sterilization against will were written by Dr. Henry Clay Sharp, who practiced medicine in Indiana, and personally did large numbers of sterilizations. He also thought it would be a, a good technique to reduce the problem, troublesome problem in male prisons of dealing with masturbation among the male prisoners and promoted it for that purpose. Uh, these laws made it perfectly legal in Indiana to do sterilization. And uh, I looked it up. Mr. Sharp 
Dr. Sharp was a graduate of the University of Louisville School of Medicine, class of 1893. So it was part of my history when I was dean there. And, and, when Hitler's government wanted to figure out how to create the Nuremberg Code to codify compulsory sterilization, they sent delegates to the United States to review Indiana's law. No purpose in reinventing the wheel will copy the way someone else has already done it. That's not me grandstanding, that's history. The same as when the government in Pretoria in South Africa wanted to know how to write anti-miscegenation laws, wanted to know how to write a legal code for apartheid, the South African government sent a delegation to Montgomery, Alabama, and to Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and uh, to Atlanta, Georgia, to copy American laws, because the Americans had already figured it out. That's history. Uh, so we figured it out, and the German government built upon what we figured out. We have photographs of the German government in the late 1930s coming to America with a, a ambassador-level authority to give Henry Ford a medal for his work for eugenics, as well as for publishing the Dearborn Independent and the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. This is a letter from Pasadena, California, in the mid-1930s, praising the German government for finally figuring out what we've been talking about and carrying it to its logical conclusion. This is an article in the American Journal of Heredity, 1942, on the breeding of Aryans and other genetic problems of wartime Germany, praising the German government for carrying forward the eugenic ideals. Remember, remember, prominent people like Kingman Brewster, who goes on to become president of Yale, Senator Taft of Ohio, who runs for president and tries to beat Eisenhower in the Republican primaries in 1952, much less Charles Lindbergh said, America got itself involved in World War I. It did us no good whatsoever. We will remain neutral for this new war. We will stay out of it. If the Germans win, we'll just trade with them. The capital system can do business with them if they want to buy with us. The oceans will protect us. Now, no one wants to talk about this anymore after Pearl Harbor, but that's the facts. Okay, remember Franklin Roosevelt runs for a third term. I will keep us out of war. Uh, and there is tremendous pro-Germany, or at least ambivalence, towards sentiment in the United States. Father Coughlin's got a popular radio show preaching anti-Semitism in the 1930s, so this is part of the story also. Why did eugenics really take off in Germany? Why did they build on what the groundwork we laid? German medicine is extremely concerned after the First World War about where will new babies come from. We have laid slaughter to our youth in the trenches of the Marne and the Somme in World War I. Where will we get new Germans from? How will we deal with that? Tremendous respect for German medicine, this cosmic feeling of the German Volk peoplehood, as well as longstanding anti-Semitism in Germany. So eugenics and these ideas take off enormously in Germany. National socialism is a political expression of our biological knowledge. German politicians love these metaphors. You are a doctor of the state, not a doctor of the person. Roma, homosexual Jews, are a cancer in the country that must be extirpated, surgically or otherwise. Disease metaphors, the idea that these disease metaphors can be carried to policy, are very much part of the German conversation. And the German medical community embraces them wholeheartedly as it raises their status when Hitler comes to power. This is the medal of German motherhood. Give birth to lots of healthy Aryan babies, and you get a medal that you can wear. So this is a classic uh, eugenics picture showing what the typical person looks like, with the pictures to show the appearance of the ears and the face at different angles for a characteristic uh, Jew. Sharon Crow, I was talking about the left ear, right ear pictures. Face masks uh, to show what a typical person looks like. And twin studies. They were fascinated by twins. Josef Mengele gets a PhD in anthropology in twin studies. Then he goes to medical school, which is the origins of his interest in twins. This is a standard eye color chart that he's matching them to. This is Mengele. And Mengele is wounded on the Russian front in World War II and requests a transfer to Auschwitz to continue his work and sends long letters back to his PhD advisor explaining uh, what uh, he's working on and how pleased he should be. Mengele does not hesitate from gassing one of the twins that he's interested in doing an autopsy, but about 160 of the twin pairs uh, survived. 
through the war uh, because of the experiments, including horrific experiments, quote experiments, like injecting dyes into the eyes of the children without their consent to see if you can make them blue-eyed, or sterilization experiments to see if they can do better ways of doing mass sterilizations. Uh, this is Fisher, benign professor of the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute, reading his copy of the American Journal of Heredity uh, and worrying about genetics and Mendel. Here we see Professor Fisher in another pose. And here we see him at a uh, genetics conference in the 1950s, right back at work. Although the exhibit that you see talks about how some of these doctors were tried at a doctor's trial and how the German Medical Association apologized about a year and a half ago for the role of medicine, this is the more common story. Most of them <coughs> took off their armbands and went right back to work and were teaching into the 1960s and in some cases 70s uh, as members of Austrian and German medicine. Uh, this is Rubin, the psychiatrist, and in front of his uh, filing cabinet of pedigrees to identify which mental health issues were maladaptive and could be weeded out. Hitler comes to power in, in 1934. There was a German law for the prevention of genetically discrete, discrete disease offspring based on American law and building upon it. They didn't think about it for the first time. And under Hitler's government, about 400,000 people are sterilized against their will, orders of magnitude more than in the United States. A year later, the law for the protection of German blood and German honor continues the process by requiring doctors to start labeling people and rounding them up. Hitler was particularly distressed by little girls like this one. At the end of World War I, in the disputed area of Alsace-Lorraine between the German-French border. This is taken by the Germans in the Franco-Prussian War in the 1870s, then France wants it back. How does France assure its title to the area? They occupy the area at the end of World War I with French colonial troops from French West Africa, black African troops. So when Hitler's in power, there are now 12 and 14-year-old little girls in school with their blonde-haired, blue-eyed classmates who are mixed race children from sexual liaisons between <coughs> black African troops and German women. Hitler cannot accept this concept that German women were having intercourse with French black African troops. This is an early group targeted for sterilization. Now, this boy is sterilized because mom is German and daddy is Algerian, uh, portrayed with the siblings. By 1939, the Ministry of the Interior starts setting up classification systems infants with these diagnoses are to be reported so they know where to find the kids. And on September 1st, 1939, with Hitler's own signature, he informs his personal physician and the Minister of Health that they are charged with the responsibility to extend powers to specific doctors in such a way that after the most careful assessment, those suffering from illnesses deemed to be incurable may be granted a mercy death. What else was going on on September 1st, 1939? Was it a quiet day at the office? Did he had time to work on this? It was the day that Germany invaded Poland. It was literally the day that Germany invaded Poland, but this was important enough that he was taking time from starting World War II to sign this order. This is the Minister of Health, and this is Hitler's personal physician. It is simply a historical fact that German doctors and medical students joined the Nazi party more quickly and in greater numbers than lawyers, than engineers, than dentists, than any other profession. They loved it. And this is Dr. Wensler. Uh, Wensler, as in Wensler's work on rickets, or for any of the older pediatricians in the audience, the so-called Wensler warmers, incubators that he invented, examining a child for rickets. He was the high society Berlin pediatrician, took care of Gables uh, girls, uh, and he also, with two colleagues, becomes supervisor for the rounding up and elimination of diseased children. The preferred technique of Wensler and his colleagues was starvation. Under supervision of three pediatricians, 5,000 children were starved to death, starved to death under the supervision of pediatricians. Starved to death, starved to death. People walking by the children's hospitals wondered why sometimes in the summer smoke was coming out, but no one seemed to be needing to heat the building, or why 
people needed to seem to have asbestos gloves in a children's hospital, or why in the ashes children's pen knives or cross or a necklace were found. And it is from this technique, for those of you who have read the story in the New York Times about the ashes from Dachau that were identified, that the Germans come up with the idea of sending ashes to the family. We're terribly sorry your child with a severe impairment died in the hospital. Oh my God, we want to arrange for the funeral. Where's the body? Uh, it died of infectious disease. Now here's the ashes. But Germans are terribly efficient. We can't simply just uh, cremate the bodies as some science is not to be done with them. So many of the children's bodies are sent to pathologists for autopsy studies. Uh, Dr. Schwartz recently sent me these pictures from going, Ira, where were you? Theresen. Uh, these are uh, autopsy instruments in Theresen. Took the pictures with the cell phone, and I didn't do so well reproducing, but you see an autopsy saw, pinacula, retractor, scissors. Uh, this is March 9, 1944. Uh, Van Holleren, the famous pathologist, neuropathologist, a receipt for sending bodies on the, on the stationery of the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute. And this is one of his specimens showing what is called Halivarden and Spates disease, neurodegeneration with brain iron accumulation. And the American Academy of Neurology is now debating whether or not you should have diseases named after people who did their work with bodies from concentration camp victims. Uh, and this is not the only such disease I am told with such a name. And thus the expansion of this is so-called life unworthy of life, that some people just don't need to be around. It's, it's too much. A very popular German movie of the late 1930s portrays the doctor is in love with this attractive woman who's a cello player, but another guy's in love with her. She marries the other guy. She develops multiple sclerosis. And then they decide she's to be given euthanasia, and her doctor who was in love with her is the one who has to do it, and this movie is shown to show how the doctor rises to the occasion and puts her to sleep because people with MS are unworthy of life. October 1939, there's a problem for the doctors, you see, and the problem is that letting kids starve to death is very wearing on resources, it takes up a lot of energy and time, so the doctors have to figure out a new technique, and the doctors come up with carbon monoxide executions through fake shower heads. This is, comes to its uh, most heavy use in psychiatric hospitals. 70,000 psychiatric patients are gassed. This is from the New Republic. This is an American reporter describing the situation. The reporter writes, the facilities were staffed by specially selected physicians and nurses. If the senior medical professionals were eugenics enthusiasts, they were also very much tantalized by their unaccustomed proximity to real power they in turn used their prestige and influence upon impressionable and fanaticized former students who became the killers of white coats. Students being one of the groups in the population converted almost en masse to Nazism. The physician's presence was only essential to give the mass murders a medicalized appearance. Since literally anyone could turn on a gas valve, the doctors were technicians whose ethical training was perfunctory or non-existent. Many become accustomed to regarding patients as an assemblage of malfunctioning mechanical parts or simply a nuisance. And many of them were not immune to careerism, greed, or political antitheism. Persons were not killed for mercy. They were killed because they can no longer manufacture guns in return for food, which they consumed because the German hospitals were needed for wounded German soldiers, because their death was the ultimate logic of a national socialist doctrine of racial superiority and the survival of the physically fit. Others will also add a fourth thing to the list, which will say that shooting people used up ammunition that the Germans would rather use to shoot at the Brits, the Americans, and the Russians. Aghast to death, psychiatric patient. How the doctors figured out? We have movies that show hooking up a metal pipe to the exhaust pipe and then pumping it into the building. You recognize the car? The Volkswagen. Volkswagen. Hitler tells Dr. Porsche he needs an automobile to serve the people, the Volkswagen. So Porsche designs Porsche sports cars that we want to drive around in and also eventually the Audi Corporation, and the Volkswagen, the Beetle-shaped car, is numbers. They stopped using Volkswagens and people, but it was the doctors who figured out, we have all this out and setting it up. This is gas into a room in a psychiatric hospital. Walk by psychiatric hospitals, which are in their neighborhood, and you're not supposed to be taking pictures, but somebody wonders why there's smoke coming out. And then 
the pact between Stalin and Hitler collapses, and Germany invades Belarus and the Ukraine, and the Baltic states, the Soviet Union, Germany sweeps across the German controlled sections of Poland, and a million people are killed in open pits. And this is a problem. Because if you have SS men and the police killing people, it's public, it's labor intensive, it uses up ammunition, it upsets the troops, and Himmler needs an alternative way to kill people. But he doesn't have to look very hard, don't need to reinvent the wheel. The doctor's already figured it out. We'll do it like they did in the psychiatric hospitals. We'll gas people. So we'll create concentration camps. So who invented the concentration camps? The Brits in the Boer War. When Britain is being driven nuts by this guerrilla warfare against the Boers in the South African Wars, they say we're going to take the heart out of the fighting men of the Boers, so we're going to concentrate the women and children and the other Boers in these camps where large numbers of them die of starvation and disease to concentrate them in these concentration camps. And we have movies of this era of the Germans saying, what are they mad at us about? The Brits are hypocrites. It was the Brits who thought of concentration camps. It was the Brits who thought of killing Indians and black Africans and colonization. And where did the Americans come off at? The place with slavery, where their own constitution said a black person was three-fifths of a human, and that chattel slavery was constitutional? What? what, what is, what's with us? You guys figured it out. And if uh, you ever wonder why Europeans don't love us, this goes back even to the 1840s, where British travel writers come to America and say, Americans are hypocrites. They raise the flag of liberty with their right hand, and they use their left hand with a whip to beat their slaves. A million Jewish children are killed in the camps. It is all the extension, a sinister extension of the concepts of eugenics, which begin in England and the United States. Doctors participate vigorously. This is Klauberg. Klauberg was interested in how quickly you can sterilize people in order to sterilize large groups of the population and conduct so-called experiments without informed consent. This is Klauberg's table for putting women up in stirrups, which is on display in the US Holocaust Museum. Killing people and sterilizing them is exhausting. Recently, a uh, family member found a photo album in dad's nightstand. Dad had swiped it when his unit in the army liberated one of the camps. And the album is full of pictures of the recreation areas that were set up near the concentration camps so that the secretaries and the soldiers could take a break. They could go swimming. They could have music time, play the accordion and drink. One of the pictures shows a bunch of secretaries. You've got to have secretaries to run a concentration camp, eating their strawberries and cream, all sitting demurely on a bench. Uh, and these are within two or three miles of the crematorium. It is an issue of what is called by some people in medical ethics the problem of the third person in the room. Who are you loyal to, your patient or the government? Questions of dual loyalty persist for physicians who can be pressured to serve state or corporate rather than individual patient interests. Uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr.'s father was Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr., the famous literary figure, the autocrat of the breakfast table and the doctor who introduced the concept of hand washing in the United States to reduce the transmission of infectious disease to women in pregnancy, Semmelweis in Europe, Holmes in the United States. And Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr. writes, the truth is that medicine, which is professedly scientific and founded on observation, is as sensitive to outside influences, political, religious, philosophical, imaginative, as is the barometer to changes of atmospheric density. But look for a moment while I clash a few facts together and see if some sparks do not reveal by their light a closer relationship between the medical sciences <clears throat> and the conditions of society and the general thought of time than would have first be suspected. It is one of the oldest concepts there is in medical history. Why do you teach medical students medical history? Because medicine is fundamentally an activity that occurs in the context of its time. It is a social activity that is not divorced from what is going around in society. And if I have not persuaded you about that so far, uh, remember that when I was in medical school under the DSM classification of psychiatric disease, homosexuality was a disease. Now homophobia is a disease. Has anything changed in the biology in my time in medicine? No, it has a change in societal attitude, which has changed the diagnostic group in the DSM, nothing else.
And at this point, I could say thank you very much and sit down, that I have reviewed the underpinnings of the exhibit. But I'm going to conclude by offering you some thoughts about how to think about whether or not the exhibit that you either have seen or will see, and what I've told you, bears on the current debate. What I've told you is a story of the progression of the medicalization of murder. It was a biologic basis for human diversity and figured out by Darwin, which leads to social Darwinism, which leads people to classify some people as socially unfit, then to classify some groups as inferior, sterilize the unfit, isolate the unfit, kill the unfit, kill them en masse. We now have to think about two concepts. Yes, Edward, but those were Nazis, and we're not. That is called in medical ethics the concept of Nazi exceptionalism. Saying those were Nazis and we're not is a statement of fact, but it is not a useful rhetorical argument. Anyone who disagrees with you is a Nazi, or anything that happened is a Holocaust. People do that at the other end also. So let's tackle this, they were Nazis and we're not. What is it when you have people have venereal disease and you know they have venereal disease, but you don't treat the venereal disease, and the US Public Health Service does it in Tuskegee experiments? What is it when we give children in the United States the polio vaccine in the 1950s, we don't give them or their kids consent to do it, but we do it because we think it's for the greater good? What is it when we take cancer patients in hospitals in New York City and inject them with radioactive isotopes to see what happens without their consent, but hey, they got metastatic cancer and let's just find out because the Army wants to know about radiation exposure. What is it when medical students of my generation get told to practice pelvic examinations on women being anesthetized for other operations because you got to learn how to do pelvic exams, but nobody tells them that. What is it when you expose soldiers to atomic blasts to see what happens March in there, soldier, or sail that boat, sailor, you're in a bikini at all. What is it when we torture people at Abu Ghraib? What did we learn about human nature from the Stanford experiments on electroshock? Push the button, push the button. Yeah, but they look like they're in pain. Push the button, and people still do. I'm trying to persuade you it's not European history. It's also ours. When Wake Forest University School of Medicine a couple of years ago issues a public apology for sterilizing women against their will, it's our history. When we abuse detainees in Iraq and Afghanistan, beatings, burns, shots, bodily suspensions, and doctors supervise it, is the doctor serving the patient or serving the interest of the government? Who invented waterboarding that was used in uh, Guantanamo? The United States Marines invented waterboarding. This is the United States Marine in the Filipino insurrection after the Spanish-American War, supervised the waterboarding of a Filipino prisoner. Waterboarding ended when President Theodore Roosevelt was told about it. Roosevelt thinks that this is conduct unbecoming an officer of the United States military and orders it to be stopped. But no one else thought of waterboarding. We thought of waterboarding. What does it mean? Who is the doctor really serving when we watch two individuals who are overwhelmingly the poor, the black, or the marginalized pummel each other's heads with their fists and induce repetitive concussions while white people bet on it in Las Vegas, but it's okay because there's a doctor at ringside. Who is the doctor really serving? What does it mean if doctors write prescriptions in the United States for muscle paralysis and cause respiratory arrests? Who is the doctor serving? They teach us that you're not supposed to do research on people without informed consent, and then informed consent means go to the IRB and get permission. So when we take sociologists and anthropologists and we put them in military uniform to conduct what's called human terrain surveillance, and their professor who's a supervisor at the University of Kansas oversees this, but we don't get consent from anybody, is that justified in times of war? And who are these professionals serving? Their research subjects or the government? When you send a patient to get a chest x-ray or a blood count, and the machine that does it is manufactured by the Siemens Corporation, is that OK because the Siemens Corporation made money using slave labor from concentration camps? 
during World War II, and they didn't get around to apologizing for it until about 30 years later without reparation, but it's still okay because they made profits and kept it. When you buy your life insurance from the New York Life Insurance Company, <clears throat> New York Life Insurance Company made a lot of money writing life insurance policies on enslaved African Americans, because if you worked your slave to death, because you loaned your slave out to build the railroads in the South, and the slave died, and the life insurance policy paid the plantation owner for his loss of property. And they rolled the profits over, and it's still in you know, the company's history. So who were they serving? Oh, do not worry, Edward. Do not worry, because the new medical students who started school on Monday are altruistic. They score very high on altruism scores women more than men. Do not worry, we wring altruism out of medical students during the four years of life. <laughs> this is Dr. Boyd. Dr. Boyd gets interested in whether American medical students actually know anything about medical ethics in time of war. He sends out a survey to medical students and gets a 35% response rate. About 1,700 students answer the survey. 94% said they've received less than an hour of instruction on military medical ethics. Any medical students in the audience today have already beat the national averages. 62% don't know the Geneva Convention applies in the absence of a declaration of war. A third do not know that doctors are supposed to speak to sickest patients first, regardless of nationality. A third are unaware that physicians are never supposed to threaten or demean prisoners. A third cannot identify a single situation where they're ethically required to disobey an order from a superior and nobody knows about the Health Care Personnel Act. I didn't either until I wrote the talk. It says that if the Congress and the President can draft all of us in times of emergency, if necessary, put doctors in the military without any other formal procedures. So there is a risk always that we could end up being military doctors. Physicians are reported to advise interrogators in the United States as to whether particular prisons were fit enough to survive physical maltreatment inform interrogators about phobias, physiological vulnerabilities, fail to report torture, force fed prisoners on hunger strikes, and altered the death certificates of those who died, subjecting women to high-dose chemotherapy outside of clinical trials for the advanced breast cancer is something we did when I was a young attending. There were no randomized trials to say it was a good idea, but people wanted to get tenure, they wanted to publish papers, those louses in the insurance companies wouldn't pay for it, so we wrote articles in the New England Journal as a profession denouncing it, Congressman Schroeder introduced bills to mandate that it got paid for. 10,000 American women died, and when the three randomized trials were done, two of them were negative, the one that was positive was shown to have scientific fraud. It didn't work. And we were driven by our own ego as a profession uh, without the data. Here's a curious one. Who do these doctors serve? I was asked to be an expert witness a couple of years ago in the following case. A child is adopted from an orphanage in Russia and brought to the United States. The child subsequently develops a brain tumor. In the litigation, the doctors had labeled the child with hypoxic encephalopathy at birth. When I reviewed the medical records under oath, I say, I see no evidence of that, although it clearly says that in the translation of the Russian chart, but nothing looks like that subsequently, and the films of the child don't look like it. And the lawyer says, very good, doctor. Mm -hmm. You see, Russian law prohibits American couples from adopting children who don't have a diagnosis out of an orphanage. The pediatricians label all the kids with a diagnosis for the purpose of getting them out of the orphanage. The pediatricians think they're serving the interest of the child, not the state. So is that OK if you violate the law and take it upon yourself? I think the government should not be in power. You must be nuts. No, no, I just think the government should not be in power. You must be nuts. The Soviet Union did this all the time, put people in psychiatric hospitals because they had the temerity to challenge the government. Uh, when I was a younger doctor, I remember being involved in a case of a doctor in Cuba who reports a case of dengue fever in his district to the public health department. Castro's government says, there is no dengue fever in Cuba. The guy says, I saw a case. I'm treating him. We say there is no dengue fever in Cuba. Yeah, but I have a patient in prison because we say there is no dengue fever. So we did a letter writing campaign, political pressure to get him out, uh, such as this example of deceptive reporting of statistics for infectious disease. I mean, a lot, of, a lot of countries did this with HIV. We don't have it here. We say we don't have it here. When South African doctors changed the death certificate of Stephen Biko to further the needs of the police, well, 
I'm going to conclude with what in ethics is called the dirty bomb problem. This is a trick that medical ethicists like to use in which you lay out an extreme case and then work your way backward to see how you would deal with it. So to sum up, let's think about the dirty bomb problem. You're the only doctor in Happy Valley, a nice little idyllic community, and you were on call the night before and you slept late. And the police wake you up at 7.15. Doctor, you're the only doctor in town. We've got a guy in custody. He says he took some radioactive material and wrapped some dynamite around it with a timer and he dropped it in a mailbox in town. He won't tell us which mailbox. There's 150. Some of them are near schools. We're going to torture him to get the information out of him. Will you help us, doctor? Do you know the police have the right guy? Do you know whether he's grandstanding or not? Is it for real? What would you do if you were the doctor? What would you do if your kid had already been picked up to be on the school bus or your grandchild? What would you do? Well, many of the questions of, that we have raised in my talk and in the exhibit address this issue of who do you serve. Uh, one way of approaching the dirty bomb problem is the book of Deuteronomy, thou shalt blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under the heaven. When a Hebrew scribe begins their work each day, they pre prepare a quill, and then they write the name of Amalek, and then they cross it out. That tests the pen and also fulfills this commandment. Because Amalek is held out for particular derision in the Old Testament because he loves to attack the stragglers behind the children of Israel, those least able to defend themselves. So you're supposed to blot out the name of this evil person. In reference to this verse, if a person willfully schemes to kill his neighbor, he shall be even taken from my altar and put to death. The 12th century physician Moses ben Maimon in Greek Maimonides writes, the wicked and calculating person who killed intentionally and was sentenced to death, if he seeks sanctuary among us, we must not provide him with asylum and not have mercy upon him, because compassion towards the wicked is cruelty to all. Regarding this verse about Amalek, Saul of the nation spirit of Gog, the Midrash says, one who becomes compassionate to the cruel will ultimately become cruel to the compassionate. As it is written, and Saul and the nation spirit of Gog, and the sheep and cattle, and Nob, the city of priests, he smote with the edge of the sword. In shorthand, this concept is written, he who is merciful to the cruel will in the end be cruel to the merciful. Is that what applies in the dirty bomb problem? Or not? What are you going to do about it? And if I were the supreme you know, medical ethicist, my next slide would now tie this all up in a nice little bow for you. And I can't do it. I can only suggest to you that history sometimes moves in a linear fashion and goes from place to place, but a lot of time history is circular. And all that really changes are the nouns, but the verbs are the same. And that we will face the same problems in medicine now as our predecessors faced in the exhibit Denley Medicine and what I've laid out this afternoon about eugenics. There's a special place in hell, Dante says, reserved for those who in times of great moral crisis remain silent. Where doctors use their powers to harm or kill lie the flames of hell. These flames burned brightly in the ovens of Auschwitz, and they were, we must acknowledge, lit and tendered by doctors. The flames of hell cast a light, and as a lighthouse can mark a reef, medicine can and must use the light from the flames of hell. The lessons learned from the Nazi doctors as a warning Deacon, thank you for listening. Uh, we have folks with microphones, because I know that I have not said anything free of controversy. If you want to go to the microphone, fine. If you just raise your hand, they will pass the microphones to you so everyone can hear, and I'll repeat the question. And uh, I know what I have said is not free of controversy. I'm happy to talk about whatever. trying to fix the microphone. Why do you think the physicians were among the first to sign up to help Hitler's cause? 
what is it about the medical profession? Is that a telling incident? I think that the question was, what was it about physicians that made them sign up in larger numbers or more uh, quickly than others? Does it tell us something about physicians? Yeah, I think what it tells us is that medicine is fundamentally a social activity and that doctors are highly susceptible to massaging their egos. <laughs> and that if you say our government thinks that doctors are the top of the heap and our government says mm -hmm. that you're going to get whatever you want and we're going to promote you and put you in positions of power and you are going to control not only writing prescriptions but who gets sterilized and who doesn't, who has life and who has death, that people bought into it in enormous numbers and that the medical students thought now we're going to be the top of the pecking order. So I think, and, but I, and I don't think there's really any difference, you know, in that now. And it's pretty easy to pick examples, right? I mean, okay, it's August. Like, what do you know for sure is going to happen starting in three weeks? In three weeks, some kids are going to die of heat prostration. Some are going to die of other forms of dehydration. Some kids are going to get spinal cord injuries. And a couple hundred thousand are going to be sent on the road to premature dementia and death from repetitive concussions. But it's okay because there's a doctor on the sidelines of the football game. And the doctor's on the sidelines of the football game because if you have your logo saying, Dr. John Smith, team doctor to the fighting Cardinals, then it's good for business. And I don't think, you know, based on your question, it's really that much farther on the bell shaped curve. Did we fix the microphone in the back for the question in the back? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hello? Yes, ma'am. And my notes. Okay, I'll just read this the way I wrote it this morning before I came. Um, how can America be the leader of the free world when the medical establishment of all countries is betting that its citizens will get sick and die? When insurance companies and our best doctors rob and gouge extort Americans to pay dearly for their, quote, health, unquote. Who benefits when patients die? Doctors, insurance companies, pharmaceutical companies. My vitamins cost me $18.50. The label says they're nutraceuticals but I had to pay $250 of my own money to find the best consultative nutritionist who doesn't take insurance. How perverse is that? Um, this, he, he only said I should order these supplements, which was a vitamin... Um, yeah, what's the time, ma'am? Are we gonna get to a question for me? Sure. In looking online last night on the on a website about eugenics, I read everything. I learned had a one half hour lesson in eugenics, and to answer that woman's question, why why were physicians involved in the murder of so many so many innocent people? And the conclusion that I read online was they did it for the money that Hitler paid these professionals from the mental institutions who had experience in gassing mental patients. He paid them the same amount that they would have gotten had they remained physicians, maybe even more. The, the ethical, same, the, yeah, same, thank you, I the, the, the money that they made doing it, and that's why the doctors did it. The, the ethical issue that we're addressing in this conversation is called by some people the problem of the third person in the room. If you go into an examining room and there is supposed to be an N of two, the patient and the doctor, and the patient thinks that the doctor is acting, acting in his or her best interest, and that is a reasonable expectation, but if there is a third entity in the room, such as your own ego to get promoted or get tenure, the insurance company, your profit motive, uh, etc., then this is, as the Bible would say, placing a stumbling block before the blind. The patient thinks there's two entities in the room, but the doctor knows there's three or more. And whether that third entity is the government, as I've talked about, or the profit motive, or the insurance industry, et cetera, is the question 
uh, raises is called the ethical problem of the third person in the room. Uh, the, let's use about the microphone, so go ahead. Yeah, hi. Well, I come from Toro's Business School, so we also try to teach ethics to basically adults. So uh, my question to you is, what lessons from this very powerful and well done exhibit uh, can we learn for the better teaching of ethics? Uh, I would hope that everyone would take away my comment about history being a circle rather than a line. And not walk away saying, wasn't that a terrible era back then? But to think about if 10 years from now we all have buccal mucosal swabs and people start knowing about what our genetics are, does that mean that employers will stop offering certain people jobs or people will select marriage partners or people will have trouble getting insurance or admissions committees won't let people into schools because of their genetic profile and what other information about us will be known that will direct us and that I would submit that the lessons of the exhibit are quite present today, all the examples I gave, and must remain in our minds because we're all going to face them. I have filled up my time. We have a panel discussion. I would propose that we take a few minute break for people to get the table set up and then we'll resume with the panel discussion. I won't be going anywhere when it's over if people want to ask me questions at the end of the panel discussion. Thank you, everyone.